Hi everyone, my name is Laura and welcome to Book Bubbler. Today's Friday Reads has a little bit of a lot of different things, so I'll just get started right away and um, try and keep this as short as possible. I have a feeling this will be a little longer than my normal Friday Reads. Anyways, tomorrow, which is April, Saturday, April, I'm going to say 11th, 10th, 11th. <laughs> um, Rainy of Rainy Day Reads and Elaine Howland of Elaine Howland are hosting a wine and cheese social reading gathering. It is from 2 to 5 Central Time, which is my time. I have no problem drinking wine in the middle of a Saturday afternoon. I'm kind of looking forward to be quite honest. But um, the idea behind this is to, well, get together, you know, read together separately, alone. Introverts unite in their own homes. Um, but also to read a book something to do with food or wine. Um, on the cover, in the text itself, it doesn't matter. So I've pulled three possibilities off of my shelves. I reached into my cozy mystery bins and pulled out the first one I saw, which is Sprinkle with Murder by Jen McKinley. This is about two rest friends who finally open up their own cupcake bakery after wanting to for a very long time. And they get a big job for some celebrity fashion designer, excuse me, for her wedding, and they find the bride next to the cupcakes at the wedding dead, apparently from ingesting something, some secret ingredient that the bride insisted on putting in there. So of course these two are trying to figure out what's really going on and clear their names so they don't get arrested. Um, it's the start of a series. I only have this book, so we'll see how this goes. My next possibility, actually my next two I pulled from my travel writing shelf. This one is Picnic in Provence, a memoir with recipes by Elizabeth Bard. So she also wrote Lunch in Paris, which I don't know if you guys have heard of that one or not. Um, so she, Elizabeth, a New Yorker, marries a Frenchman. They live in Paris and they're pregnant and um, they decide to move to Provence and raise their child in the countryside versus raising them in Paris. So it must be about everything about that. They're selling their place in Paris and moving to the south of France and finding life and all that stuff. So this should be nice, easy reading, fairly delightful, I am assuming. Next up, I think was the one that might actually be the one that I read, and that is Shark's Fin and Szechuan Pepper, a sweet sour memoir of eating in China by Fuchsia Dunlop. So she is the first, I think only American to have graduated from the uh, very famous Chinese culinary school. What is this? Sichuan Institute of Higher Cuisine. Um, and it's about her memoir starting in China from 1994 all the way through whenever she reads, writes this. I am not sure, 2000 and something, um, eight. Um, but she has such an interesting life and I read one of her cookbooks, courtesy of my library a few years ago, and was fascinated. I mean, I would not make most of the things in there, but it's so interesting. I really think reading recipes from other countries is fascinating. So I'm looking forward to getting to know Fuchsia a little bit differently than just her books or just from seeing her on Anthony Bourdain's show. And I think she was on a different travel show too, though I don't remember which one, but I remember Anthony Bourdain. So I think I'll be reading this one, but those are my possibilities for the wine and cheese social. Um, next up, I'll do the books that came in this week. It's an unexpected haul. I really did not expect anything. So this one I won from Library Thing Early Reviewers Program and um, the publisher, which is Teacher Perigree, Perigee Books, excuse me, and Penguin Random House. And that is Bewitching the Elements by Gabriella Herstick, a guide to empowering yourself through earth, air, fire, water, and spirit. So I believe it draws from all sorts of religious and mm, pagan and anything really, meditation, Breathwork, tarot, crystals, rituals, and journaling. Um, so I didn't remember signing up to enter this drawing, but apparently I won it. Thank you. <laughs> I already started it and it's really lovely. And something unusual I have not seen, be seen before is this. I don't know if you can tell, but the ink is dark blue through the whole book, which is actually really soothing to read. It's 
not as much of a strain and it's not like brown. Sometimes brown can be a little hard to read too, but this blue is really nice. And look at this beautiful cover. I mean, come on. So thank you very much to the publishers for this. Then I don't know when I ordered these, probably beginning of March, um, but I got this copy of Drawing Down the Moon, which is Druids, Goddess Worshippers, and Other Pagans in America by Margot Adler. This is a classic of this sort of new age pagan -y genre. I've seen this on bookshelves, in stores, in homes, in classrooms, off and on throughout my entire life and had sort of forgotten about it. It's just always sort of there. You just see this orange spine and you go, yeah, that's that book, you know, whatever. Um, but I recently saw a review of it um, through the Witch's Box. I'll link her below too. And she talked about what an important book this was and how this newer revision, 30 years from the original, is still incredibly helpful and a great resource and is full of information on all sorts of things. So I figured it would be a great reference book, if nothing else, but I have plans to read this very slowly, take my time, jump around if I want to, just see what happens. But it should be really interesting, and I'm glad to finally own a copy myself. The next up is the second in the Nine Realms series, The Queen of Raiders by Sarah Kozlov. This series is, I think the fourth book is just published next week. It's a um, quartet of books. The first one was published in January, this was February, third was in March, April is coming up still. So it's a whole fantasy series all out within four months. And in this time of quarantine and self-isolation, I thought I better get the second one, even though I have the first one and it's still unread, of course. I'll get the second one just in case I really like it and it's a cliffhanger at the end of the first one. I'll be so annoyed if I have to wait a month <laughs> to get the second. So here's the second, waiting for me to read it eventually. And this last one was a gift from one of my Litzy friends, Marion Hill, um, who is an author. I just bought his first book set in the, I believe it's science fiction fantasy set in the world of Cambia that he created. But um, he was clearing out his shelves and decided to give away some, some of his books to whoever responded first for whatever ones they wanted. So I piped up right away and got this trilogy by Robin Hubb. So I have now Ship of Magic which is the first in this trilogy, but the sixth, wait, one, two, three, the fourth in the overarching trilogy, the name of which escapes me. You will probably all know this and be yelling at me through the screen, but whatever. Um, so I have the first one on that whole big series, Assassin's Apprentice. I have that one, Missing Two and Three. Then there's this one, Ship of Magic, and then Mad Ship. I like these old covers, older covers, and Ship of Destiny. So I have a feeling I will really like Robin Hobb and that I'm going to just absolutely get plowed into and sunk into her writing and her books. So thank you very much to Marion for sending me those. That was a really delightful treat. Okay, ready for more? <laughs> Next up, I've got Aussie April, which is being hosted by Jacqueline at Six Minutes for Me and Doris at Aldi Books. And I didn't troll too long on my shelves for some of these because... I knew exactly where they were and exactly where I wanted to start off with Aussie April. So I'm starting with Eucalyptus by Murray Bale. I had never heard of Murray Bale before and I wish I knew how I heard about this book. I've had this on my shelves for a very long time, but I bought some used copy somewhere. It's a love story about a eucalyptus plantation in the outback and this beautiful young lady has to, um, she's going to get married, she's looking for a suitor. And their task, all of her suitors' tasks, are to correctly name the species of each of the hundreds of gum trees on the property. So she finds a strange young man resting under some trees one day, and he starts telling her tales about like far time, far time stuff in the future, you know, all these stories. And as she's falling for him, she's still going through the prospect of all of these suitors looking for her hand in marriage. So it's a bit of an unusual love story. I'm not sure when it's even set. Um, but yeah, I had never heard of Murray Bale either. And I looked him up. Apparently he's a classic Australian author. News to me. Have anyone, has anyone heard of him before? Tell me about him. If you've read this book, please let me know. I'm really interested. So that's Eucalyptus. And then these next three are really nailing the head of the <laughs> here. So 
These are all books from my grandparents and great grandparents. So first up, the extremely, extremely literate, <laughs> right on, I mean, that's what it says, Illustrated Australia and New Zealand by William D. Boyce. And this has a lovely map on the inside. To Mr. David White with the compliments and best wishes of the author, a very nice signed nameplate. There's Billy Boyce himself. This was published by Rand McNally in 1922. And it is full, ooh, that's creepy, full of pictures. It's this lovely old glossy paper and it covers all aspects of New Zealand and Ooh, there's a rip in a page there. Australia, Tasmania, wildlife, all sorts of things. I mean, so I don't know who Mr. White is, but this I think is older than my grandparents. So I'm not sure where we got this from, but that sounds fascinating. Like a Friday Fisher time view of Australia and New Zealand. So looking forward to this one. And the next two I remember reading when I was really small, but I haven't touched since then. They were both gifts from my uncle's college roommate. We were friends with him and his family, well, since the 60s. Um, and they lived in Tasmania. So he sent us both of these books. Jerry sent us both of these books about the dream time. So there's this one, The Dream Time, Australian Aboriginal Myths and Paintings by Ainsley Roberts with text by Charles P. Mountford. There is a very lovely inscription in the front for both of them from Jerry and Ginny, his wife. Um, but it's, it looks like this inside. So there's an illustration or a graphic of some kind with a small text that goes along with it. And I remember staring at these pictures and trying to understand some of the words, but not really getting it, but just the dream time in general. It, it seems like such a myth in my brain and it seems like it's so ingrained in me in a, in a really strange way. Um, but it's because of this book and the next one in particular, that's the case. And that is this, People of the Dream Time. This is by um, Douglas Bagland and David R. R. Moore. And this is primarily, this is a bad example of a page here, photographs with some writing next to them. Um, so I, like I said, just tons of time spent at my grandmother's house here on the floor, reading through these books and reading about the dream time and seeing the tools that they made and the masks and about their lives and how the 20th century and white man is coming in and wiping them out. I mean, yeah, so very specific, really on the nose, but I'm excited for these three nonfiction accounts of Australia and of course the fictional one of eucalyptus too that would be interesting but really I'm looking forward to as an adult reading both of these books about the dream time. So that's Aussie April and then I'm also participating in Katie at Books and Things her TBR clear out for the month of April. That's sort of my goal for the whole year is to try and read as much as of my TBR as possible Getting rid of things, of course, is always a goal, but if you've been here for more than one video, you know that that is not really what I do, generally speaking. Um, so that's the goal, but you know, whatever. So as I'm going through books here, they're gonna be primarily off of my TBR. So what did I read this week? I finished one, two, three, four, five, six. I finished seven books this week, which sounds more impressive than it actually is because all of them, except for I think two, were on the go for months before. So first up, I did the audio version of this book, but that is Reflex by Dick Francis. I gave this one three stars. It was just fine. The problem lie, problem lay is really with me because I, I took so long to listen to it and read it back and forth. I think I started in October and I just really wound it up at like over last weekend. So this follows a jockey, part-time jockey and part-time photographer who was being blackmailed by another part-time jockey and photographer who was blackmailing a lot of people. So, um, and his son is also a jockey who is friends with the main character here. So after the blackmailer guy dies, um, his widow and her, she gets beaten up, her house gets tossed twice and then gets burned to the ground. 
um, another person's house gets burned to the ground and the person gets beat up. And it's all these unusual chemicals that are used in developing pictures that tend to be the ignition. And um, some it's somehow involved with the racetrack somehow and fellow jockeys and horse owners, but also with this guy and um, trying to figure out his trail and who he was blackmailing and trying to figure out who is beating people up still since the blackmailer has passed away. So really interesting, like all of Dick Francis's books, he and his son, Felix, really researched the heck out of every different um, occupation that their jockeys also carry. And it was really fascinating. I only gave it three stars because it took me so long and I didn't quite remember exactly who was who, some of the more minor players, but that's my fault, not the books. So I'll be reading more Dick Francis again, but glad to have this one done after all those months. Next up is Hidden Depths by Anne Cleves. This is the third in the Vera Stanhope mystery series. And even though I've only watched the series all the way through one time. I still remember this story quite a bit. So this was more of a skim read than an actual read read. Um, I don't know why I remember this one so much, but I really do. So there is one of the dead bodies is of a new school teacher into town. Um, one of her students who she was renting a house from the student's parents um, finds her on the beach dead like the next day or two days after she moves into the house. There's another death in the village and it's all Vera comes in and tries to connect how people know each other because everyone seems to come from such different parts and not just from the north of England. Um, trying to figure out who the killer is and I believe there's blackmail in this one as well. But this was good. Three stars. Again, I think it was lower just because I remembered who done it from the series when I watched it several months ago. But anyways, that was that one. Next up, The 100 Best Poems of All Time, edited by Leslie Pockel, or Pockel, I'm not sure which it is. So this loosely follows throughout the ages and countries all around the world, 100 of the quote-unquote best poems. And like any collection like this, it's such a broad scope that there are lots of hits, lots of misses. So this was just a three star for me. Um, but it was nice to reread Emily Bronte's poetry again. It had been a while since I had read something of hers. And there was one Thomas Hardy in here too, and I really like his poetry. Um, a lot of the very old stuff I didn't do much for me. Stuff from Metamorphosis and uh, Lipo and Sappho. And I mean, it was all fine, but I, I don't know. So whatever, glad to have poetry under my belt since this is National Poetry Month. Then next up is a book from my mom's childhood, and that is Once Upon a Time, 20, 20 Cheerful Tales to Read and Tell. I think that's a very debatable <laughs> title there. Um, selected, edited, and sometimes retold by Rose Dobbs and illustrated by Flavia Gag. These tales were mostly horrifying and horrible. <laughs> I think they're only cheerful if you had a very narrow view of the world and or you think smiting people is cool and or casual racism is your bag. <laughs> it is of its time, 1950s. I mean, some of it I really kind of, I mean, it's cute little illustrations. Um, but some of it I kind of said, what? Out loud a few times. Um, yeah, I just, it was fine. I'm gonna give this back to my mom and see if she wants to keep it. Otherwise I'll get rid of it, but I'm gonna give it two stars because it is what it is. And just because something is not PC doesn't mean it shouldn't exist anymore and we shouldn't talk about it. I understand all that, but it was just not cheerful in the way that the title said it would be. So that's fine. Then I finally finished Between the World and Me by Tana Hesse Coates. This is supposed to be a way forward um, for African Americans, for black people in general, but specifically in America and um, problems with race and um, Mr. Coates' own experiences, his youth growing up, um, college years with his wife, his son, this whole letter is written, a whole letter, whole book is written as a letter to his son. And Toni Morrison gives it extremely high praise on the back. And 
I only thought it was okay. Maybe I read this wrong. I don't know. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But what seems, what it says it is, is a way forward and um, re uh, beautifully redemptive. And I'll just read Toni Morrison's quote on the back. I've been wondering who might fill the intellectual void that plagued me after James Baldwin died. Clearly it is Tana Hissy Coates. The language of Between the World and Me, like Coates's journey, is visceral, eloquent, and beautifully redemptive, and its examination of the hazards and hopes of black male life is as profound as it, as it is revelatory. Blah. This is required reading. I didn't find it revelatory. I, his life is interesting, absolutely, and I liked hearing that about that, but it seemed more like a memoir to me than as some touchstone in literature. And clearly, I am not a black man. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but so maybe I am not the target audience. I, I don't know. But his writing was very nice, easy to read, lovely. I liked hearing his points of view on a lot of things. I liked hearing how he addressed his son and Really, I really liked hearing about his life the most, but I, it's not quite what I thought it was going to be. This was okay. I think if it was marketed differently, I would have rated it higher, but because I had different expectations coming in, and again, that's my fault, not the books, I just, it was fine. It was fine. When I bought this four years ago when it was first published, I would have been much more hyped about it, and I probably would have rated it five stars, but given that it's been a few years now, and the world is both so different and the same at the same time. It's just a different reading experience. So if anyone's read this, please let me know. If I read this wrong, let me know. Like, I'd like to know. Okay, second to last book I finished is Twas the Night Shift Before Christmas by Adam Kay. I was trying to save this little guy for the holiday season, and I just thought, screw it. I want to read it now, so I did. Um, this is just as wonderful and funny and heartwarming and horrifying and um, impassioned as his book, This Is Going to Hurt. I highly recommend reading this no matter where you live in the world. It's, I mean, it's just, I just loved it. And I will be rereading this probably this Christmas, if not throughout the year off and on along with his other book. And I can only hope that he writes more. I don't care what he writes. I just like his writing at this point and think he's a funny guy. So yes, God bless the NHS. Wish we had it here. Very lastly, I just finished today. I spent all morning reading this book, finishing up The Historian by Elizabeth Kostova. Sorry, I'm trying to flip you guys off here. Um, this chunkster, um, 600 some pages about vampires and Dracula, whether he really exists or not. You follow two timelines, one um, sort of current day, though it seems like from... 20 or 30 years ago in a lot of ways, and also into the past, as in like the 50s and 60s too. So you follow the a teenage daughter and her dad. So the current time is the teenage daughter and the dad starting to tell her stories about his research and he travels as some kind of a salesman or something throughout mostly Eastern Europe. They live in Amsterdam and he's telling her about his tales and she finds this packet of letters hidden in his library and that's she asks him about them and he starts telling her about his life and how like what those letters really mean and when he goes where he goes and to be very careful and then you flash back to his own time when he was about his daughter's age a little older in college and how he got involved in researching Dracula and the vampires and the disappearance of his beloved professor who's um, helping with his dissertation and it's so it jumps back and forth in time and it was a little confusing sometimes sometimes it took me a couple of paragraphs to figure out exactly who was talking and when we were um i i also thought this was overly long i mean it could have cut down by 200 pages and been a little more um snappy a little more tense a little more um engaging it just seemed to kind of drag on and a lot of times the dad both in his past life especially in the current life was so clueless and dense I was just going oh come on like you cannot be this dense buddy 
you're looking for vampires and you are almost positive that they exist, but you keep seeing the same person pop up all over Europe after they followed you in the States and followed you in Oxford. And each time you are astonished and unbelieving for literal pages until you see his face fully and then you are aghast and shocked. And oh my God, I can't believe it. Like, dude, of course. How dumb are you? Um, minor bitch, but a bitch nonetheless. Um, so this was fine for me. I'm going to give it three stars because I think as I get some distance between it, I will think it's better than it actually was because currently right now it's sort of at a two for me, just okay. But I'm giving it, bumping it up to a three because I think once I get away from the frustration of how slow it was and how dense the main character, the main guy was, um, I will be more forgiving. So yeah, this has been on my shelf since 2005. And I only know that because this was a shock to me when I opened up the book to look into it. I met Elizabeth Costova and got her to sign the book. She must have come into Milwaukee for a signing because I saw this. And honest to God, you could have knocked me over. I was like, what? I have no recollection <laughs> of meeting her or signing this at all. Like, not a clue. So that's this big chunkster off of my shelf. And I would honestly get rid of it if it wasn't signed. That's not like, I don't mean to be mean, but I, it just didn't do a thing for me. So that's almost everything. What's coming up still this week, I'm trying to focus on the books that I already started. I mean, I'll probably start like three new ones this week because that's just how I roll, but I'd like to get some of the backlog cleared out of the ones I've been in the middle of for quite a long time. So part of that clear out is to finish up Ruby by V.C. Andrews. I'm halfway through. I can finish this up probably in a few hours. It's not like it's a huge dense text. I know what happens loosely. I remember now that I'm reading more into it. My teenage brain is sort of going, oh yeah, that's right. Um, so I'll finish this up, I'm sure, this week and enjoy the delightful incest that I'm sure it is to come because that's kind of her bag. Then uh, for my Classics Book Club, which should be meeting today, I'm taping this on Thursday, um, I'm reading <laughs> Walpole's The Castle of Otranto, mostly because I was reading Cecilia for the first few months of the year for book club, and I figured this little tiny thing should be a much easier read. The bummer about this edition, and I don't know where I found this, I must have gotten it online, is that someone went in and highlighted with blue highlighter throughout, and at the beginning of the book, too, there's a bunch of writing in it, and that's annoying. But whatever, I just want to read it and get it off of my shelf. If I really like it a lot, I will look for an unmolested copy. But that's coming up this week. And another one that has been sitting here, I've been currently reading it since Nonfiction November in 2019. That is This Big Boy, The Age of Wonder by Richard Holmes. It covers mostly the 17th century and all sorts of people and all sorts of scientific genres. Genres? Areas. That's the word I mean. Um figuring out all sorts of stuff and every kind of thing, chemistry and um, about the universe and about anesthesiology and ballooning and travel and disease stuff. And I'm only halfway through, but it's got a huge cast of characters. It's pretty dense, interesting as heck, but I just want to get this thing finished now. Like it's been long enough. That's fine. And for the very last thing, see, this is going to be so long. I have my music for you guys to listen to if you would like. So I pulled this one off of my shelves. I forgot that I had a CD. When I was first starting with Massage, there was really only one really big name in um, sort of new age music, and that's Wyndham Hill. So this is Peace of Mind, a sampler of all different music. Specifically, I'm going to link you to Karana by Tim Story. That was the easiest one I could find that was not so jarring. For some reason, a lot of stuff, a lot of new agey music has a lot of flutes in it. I don't mind a flute sometimes. Sometimes it's a little shrill, like, I don't need a piccolo trying to chill me out. Like <laughs> Clarinets and, you know, alto flutes, yes, absolutely, that's just fine. But also, like, bring it down a notch. They're so loud sometimes coming through. I was listening to this trying to find the right song to link to, and... Some of it was like, oh boy, that, that is definitely a flute. <laughs> I don't know whoever balanced this did not do a great job. Anyways, so I'm going to link this Tim Story song, which is the 13th on here. 
I think it's about three or four minutes and no, it doesn't say, why would it say? But I hope you enjoy the link. And thank you for listening to me talk so much today. This Friday Reads covered a lot of ground and I'm glad to have a bunch of stuff checked off of my shelves and get tucked into some wine and cheese reading and some Aussie reading. Next Friday, I think I'm going to talk about the German books I have coming up. And um, hopefully this week too, I will be able to finally tape my Octofinals Book 2 Prize thoughts. Because I have some thoughts. It was good, but yeah. So I hope you're all doing well, staying safe, staying home, washing your hands, don't touch your face. I touch my face all the time, so I'm guilty of that too. But take care of yourself, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Happy reading. Bye, guys.